Normally, I would do a more formal introduction of a speaker that is blessing us by coming and sharing his time, but Paul's, Paul's qualifications, first off, the FOG index is just way over my head, and his the acronyms of everything that he's been involved in in his very long storied career is almost too much to read. So I want to just tell you something more personal. What I love about Paul is that despite all these qualifications and knowing so much, his knowledge, his expertise, that is just off the hook, he's a really down to earth person. Sometimes when you deal with um, academics, scientists, like anybody that's in that realm, they, they have a personality of a wet noodle. And, and yeah, they might be able to share content that is interesting, but you don't have that connection. And when Paul and I first met virtually, um, I felt a connection to him. He's, he's just a real person who has an incredible heart and just delightful to hear, and he breaks things down in a way that makes it a little bit easier for us to all understand. So, Paul, I'm going to pass it off to you and let you help them understand a little bit more about your background and why you're qualified to be speaking on all this today, and then take it away from there and educate many of us who are very much in the dark about what you know about and live and breathe every day. Okay, well, that's most wonderful introduction I've ever gotten. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you have to excuse me here. Uh, this is normally an hour long briefing and I believe I have 25 minutes, right? Uh, and then maybe five minutes for questions. So I'm gonna go a little fast in all this. And then a little bit of a cautionary note. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico and believe it or not, even though I guess it's spring, we have a major snowstorm going out there and there's all this heavy snow on power lines and all. So I hope I just don't blink out at some magical point. Okay, this is a general introduction to outer space warfare, something I've been doing for actually 48 years now. But uh, there's a little bit of an emphasis at the end of the space war that occurred in 2014 uh, over that Ukrainian conflict back then. And what's happening in space, as far as we could tell publicly uh, already uh, this year. So yeah, I've been around the block. Uh, I've worked um, with the uh, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, National Security Council, uh, Space and Missile Systems Center in LA. Uh, last 28 years, I've been in Air Force Research Lab here at uh, uh, in Albuquerque. And uh, I have a uh, a large uh, a LinkedIn base that I have weekly uh, discussions in outer space warfare. There's close to 20,000 members there now. And there's like over 1,800 general officers and admirals. I think it's a couple hundred people from the White House, uh, former secretaries of defense and so forth. So you might want to join that at some point and I'll show you uh, contact information on that. So general introduction. Um, now I want to emphasize that I think in this country, we uh, talk way too much uh, about technologies. And whether you're talking about ancient Greek warfare or futuristic space warfare, it's still between human minds. And it's between adversary commanders and between their, their culture, their education, their experience, their fears, uh, whatever. And they're transmitting intent, resolve, will on the other adversary commander. Um, via forces, troops, uh, airplanes, sailors, and so forth. And so you really have to think of that. Uh, and there's plenty of examples through military history. Uh, you know, World War II is the big one uh, where um, allied uh, uh, forces had 17 times more tanks than the Germans and even better tanks, yet the Germans still won in the Blitzkrieg because they had, uh, better thoughts, better doctrine, what, however you want to uh, say that. So the other thing too is uh, I study ancient history along with futuristic history that uh, this is an interesting uh, quote from Polybius, uh, you know, uh, more than two centuries, uh, two millennium ago, uh, that it's not the objective of war to annihilate those who have given provocation for it, but ultimately to mend them to cause their ways. So it's Clausewitz's uh, uh, statement of uh, war is politics by other means. So 
I've realized just in the last few weeks that you might concentrate on fighting this war, but really there's three phases. There's peace, war, and post-conflict. And the um, peace, you're in a sense fighting the war by training, you're developing doctrine, uh, financing different weapon systems and, and so forth. So you're trying to figure out what you might need during the conflict, during the conflict you're fighting, but most importantly, you're fighting the peace. The whole point of the conflict is to change the geopolitical landscape and the peace. So you really have to think that through, that what you're doing. And you know, earlier was mentioned, oh, well, gee, I got all these great technologies and uh, look at what I did. I created all the space debris. Well, you won the war and lost the peace, you know, so you screwed up. And quite frankly, no one in the U.S. Space Force is thinking along these lines. They're just thinking tactically and all that. The other uh, famous quote uh, is from Trotsky, famous commie, uh, saying, you might not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. So you could sit there and say, oh, I don't want war in space. Oh, that's terrible, you know, even though there's nobody's going to get killed in there and, and stuff like that. But it's going to happen anyway. Russia, China, India, North Korea, Iran are all developing these space capabilities and weapon capabilities. And just think what you would be able to do without satellite communications, the, uh, the timing information that comes from GPS for financial transactions and so forth. I mean, it's really a, a big thing. And this is kind of the whole landscape. I'm not going to go through all this, but when you're talking about space war, uh, you're really talking about either attacking the satellite, let's say here, attacking the ground systems or attacking the links between them. And the latest in thing now uh, are what's called inspector satellites. And these are um, things that come up close and many times have manipulator arms on them and saws and drills and all that. And to me, this is a, a perfect space weapon. It's like taking a satellite, putting it in a wheelbarrow, I wheel it into my garage and I start going at it. Well, let's cut this wire, let's saw this, let's bend this, let's drill a hole here, you know. There's all sorts of funny business actually that's been going on. And uh, I'll get to it later. I have to be careful what I say that's classified or not classified. Uh, a very small part here, this is, uh, the oldest wor word in the English language. Some know uh, as Ainana or Ishtar, which is star, uh, the goddess of the heavens. And it's uh, uh, later than, well, earlier than Sumerian. This is its symbol, a star symbol. Uh, it's uh, earlier than the Akkadian. It's probably about 10,000 years old, but that's kind of my symbol because I'm a space geek, I guess. Okay, history of space war. Well, even the Romans talked about space war. They had uh, Roman legions attacking the moon, and I guess they had giant spiders are attacking, things like that. So it's at least been in the imagination for many years. Uh, talk about imagination, even in the 1950s. Look up Frank Tinsley. He was a famous artist back then, and here's this space fighter destroying a satellite kind of thing. So there was a lot of thought going on before well, I guess that's just after 1957, Sputnik launch and so forth. Here's a, a space weapon system, a missile that'd go up and attack a satellite. The Russians had an anti-aircraft cannon on their Almaz. You can look that up. And if you get a copy of this briefing, you can click here and see all that. I was on the F-15 anti-satellite program at the Pentagon in the 1980s. Uh, the Russians had their kinetic kill anti-satellite, ASAT. There's all kinds of concepts going on for different lasers or space planes. And we've, we're developed, well, we have the X-37B is a space plane that goes up unmanned. Uh, and um, who knows what it's doing up there? Now it's capable of doing a lot of things if you get up and close. And then I mentioned there's many ways to skin the cat, so to speak. And this is Desert Storm. We took out the heavy earth terminals there, so the Iraqis, uh, couldn't use their space assets that they were leasing from other uh, factors. So there's been about uh, 10 space wars or incidents since the 1970s. And this is what I've been able to detect um, with my research, which means there's two or three times that many. 
uh, I remember going to Laurel, Maryland, and uh, there's an FCC Earth monitoring station that looks at satellite interference. And they told me in the 1960s, uh, the ComSat, satellite called ComSat was jammed uh, for several days uh, by a signal coming from the uh, eastern uh, coast, off the eastern coast. So they figured it was a Russian trawler. Uh, CSAT, that is, uh, measures ocean wave height. And when I was very young in my 20s, I had a NASA employee who uh, started to work where I was working. And he told me that um, they turned on CSAT and I said, oh my gosh, they can detect submarines at uh, operating depth because just a little bit of wiggle of on the surface, the sea height could see a long line going miles of where the submarine's going. In other words, it uh, negated one third of the US triad. So he claimed NASA faked its death. Now, decades later, I'm working at the Satellite Assessment Center in, here in Albuquerque, and it was their favorite target to look at imagery. This is from the ground, compensated imagery. And it's all bent out of shape. It obviously was attacked somehow, and who knows what that was about. Okay, mid-1980s, uh, almost the whole year, neither the Russians nor the Americans could launch anything into space. Every time something was launched, it would fail and fall. It looked like a tit-for-tat attacks against our various systems. A real event in the 2010s, I can't talk about, uh, but some say it was a drunken Russian colonel who started it. Uh, I've been told about a Chinese attack the NOAA system in 2014. You can look that up online. Um, I'll talk about the GLONASS attacks that happened in 2014. And then put on your thinking cap for politics. Here we got the US Space Force. Uh, and uh, it was presented to Congress that we should establish this whole new uh, force. And the Republicans and the Democrats couldn't agree on anything, but they could readily agree on the Space Force. And that's because they were briefed what happened uh, in 2017 was a major incident. And these congressional members say, oh my gosh, we really got to have a Space Force. And it's funny too, because um, just a few, a few months ago, uh, they, uh, uh, one of the uh, major news uh, announcers was interviewing one of the space generals. And he exactly described this attack, but he put it in, in terms of, well, what if this would happen? what would be your response? So it's obvious the news media know about it, political types know about it. I was in France last uh, November and they told me what it was, what had happened. So the rest of the world knows about it. We just sit here fat, dumb and happy and, and don't know anything about it, you know, kind of thing. So uh, there's all these things happening all the time. Okay, try to go quicker here. The thing is with space is, uh, the Space Force is still thinking tactically. Oh, someone attacks my one satellite. But because space is global, anything you do in space has global consequences, strategic consequences, and it's highly political. At the same time, though, it's outside the public purview. You can have all these space wars and the people don't really know about it. So it's very easy to hide, not only from the populace, but from the rest of the government. I know, I did it for 27 years. Uh, all kinds of special things that we were doing. Uh, and then the, some of the prime characteristics of space wars is you got to know what's happening. It's called space situational awareness. And because satellites are tens of thousands of kilometers away, you really can't image them. You really can't understand what's happening. And so it's kind of unstable in, in one sense. It's almost like nuclear war, only not as dramatic, um, that uh, it might almost be that whoever shoots first wins, because you can't really figure out what's happening until it's too late. So position your satellites right, you know, do you position them to do a war over Europe? Do you position them to do a war over uh, Western Pacific? You know, that pre-conflict positioning is everything. And then maneuverability to be able to get out of the way or be able to attack and so forth. And then ultimately is decisiveness. My 
uh, analyses have shown that space wars are over with in 24 to 48 hours. And I think we would probably self deter because, you know, I, the word I get from uh, national command authorities, you know, presidential level is they're not going to attack until they know who attacked you. Well, anti satellite systems attacking a satellite aren't going to have big red stars painted on the side. They're probably 90% US parts anyway, or Western parts. You know, it's really hard to say, well, was it intentional? Was it accidental? Was it solar flares? Did a meteor hit my satellite? You know, did things break like my computer breaks one now and again at all? It's, it's too uh, squishy. You're not really sure exactly what's happening. Okay, a specific example, a space war over the Ukrainian conflict. A little bit of the history. It starts 20 February, 2014, when a whole bunch of people started getting killed. Uh, in 15 March, 2014, the Ukrainians actually jammed uh, and did a cyber attack against the Russian communication satellite. And you can click on these links and you know it's all in the press. I'm sure there was other things happening, but... And then what I really wanna to talk to you about is the 2nd of April, the entire uh, Russian GLONASS, which is their GPS system went down. And I can mathematically prove that we attacked it. Um, and obviously uh, the Russians didn't get the message because two weeks later we attacked again. And then there's a bunch of other satellites uh, that are uh, suddenly starts, uh, you know, getting uh, fishy, starts not working, actually fall out of the sky, so to speak. Um, and then there's various means of space war. It's not only attacking the satellite or the terminal, maybe it's slipping in uh, some sort of cyber part 10 years before that goes into the satellite then you have access to. Maybe it's economic sanctions, diplomatic, and so forth. So uh, on 30 of April, uh, the Russia conduct what I call maybe a diplomatic economic attack uh, because the only way we were getting to the International Space Station was using Russian Soyuz rockets. And so they said, uh, okay, well, if you want to get to the space station, you got to use a trampoline now. You know? And so that's you know, a threat and uh, deterrence or, or whatever you want to call it. So. Uh, one of the more unusual ones, on 16th May, the Russians launched uh, a communication satellite, $200 million satellite, that was going to uh, cover the eastern Ukraine. Um, and it never got into space. The uh, missile launching it crashed on a Chinese village when Putin was in uh, Beijing selling Russian space capabilities. Now, I can't prove we did that. It's, it's too clean a, a, a thing, you know, it, it's suspicious, let's say. And so there's a bunch of other satellites that start going out. Now, something interesting, uh, the, Rush, the European Galileo satellite, which is their GPS, uh, had a launch failure uh, from Guiana in South America, but it was launched on a Russian Soyuz rocket. And again, I can't prove anything there, but um, it almost sounds like the Russians were th uh, threatening the Europeans about the Ukrainian conflict and maybe purposely crashed their own rocket. I don't know. But this is what I'm getting at of, um, oh, we love this technology. And you could see it in the US Space Force. Their eyes get big. Oh, look at this weapon and, and this and that. But you got to think of the bigger picture. So. We were doing all this great work in space, attacking these satellites, certainly attacking GLONASS. And uh, the Russians got pissed off at it and they conducted a, a cyber attack on the American banking system. Go ahead, look it up. You know, on uh, 28 August, it was in the newspaper, uh, five major banks in New York City had tens of millions of their bank accounts and stock accounts downloaded. And the banks at the time said, well, it looks like it's coming from Russian servers, you know. And then a few days later, it's all hushed up. You don't hear anything about it. But suddenly that week, Obama stopped talking bad about uh, Russia and the Ukrainian conflict that was going on. And a week later, all the parties were at the negotiating table. So I interpreted that to mean that we won in space but lost on the ground because Russia grabbed these uh, stock accounts and so forth and threatened that, well, we'll release them to hackers or something if you don't stop doing what you want us to stop doing, you know? 
so you gotta, that's in sense space war attacking the American banking system. So you really gotta, you know, think of all that bigger picture. Okay, so why did I uh, see what had happened uh, with the GLONASS attack? This is a published at the time. This is uh, England and the English Channel. This big red dot is where a user was located with a, a GLONASS receiver. And these are uh, the locations the receiver is telling him that he actually was in, which weren't real. You know, there was a cyber attack that changed the timing signal or something like that that made those GLONASS uh, signals essentially inoperative and hopefully no airlines were using them to land and things like that. And then the Russians published the date and time that their various GLONASS satellites started going out. And it's like, well, you know, I've got orbital dynamic software. I'm gonna plug in the uh, orbital elements of the GLONASS satellites and see where they were every time they, you know, punched out uh, at the end. And Lo and behold, every time they came over Alice Springs, Australia, uh, they would uh, stop working, the GLONASS satellites. And they stopped working exactly at 6.30 a.m. local Australian time. And if there was several GLONASS satellites in view at the time, they would blink out in numerical order, GLONASS 1, 2, and 3. And it was obviously intentional kinds of things. And oh, by the way, uh, the U.S. would probably talk about its uh, uh, mobile counter-communication systems that's a cyber weapon against satellites. It's down in Alamogordo. Here's a picture of it, the Air Force published and all. And I really wonder if they went down to Alice Springs, which, by the way, is Pine Gap. Uh, and there's at least three Australian movies about this super secret NSA listening site in the 1960s. Um, so they probably went there or they had some other weapon they, they put in there. But as far as the orbital dynamics, mathematics are concerned, every time a GLONASS satellite came over Pine Gap, uh, it would blink out. So it was kind of obvious to me, at least. So conclusions, um, failures of seven Russian satellite systems of over four months, very unusual. The GLONASS attacks, uh, I, it can mathematically prove that they, were, uh, uh, that they happened. The rest are kind of circumstantial. Um, attacking the American bank system is what stopped the whole thing. And so I assume that really the US lost the war in space, the first general war. Okay, lessons learned. The GLONASS attacks were too obvious. You could have had it done on other places around the, the world instead of just right there. Uh, and so you've got to understand the bigger picture also. Okay, what's happening now? Well, there's a lot of things happening this year uh, due, due to the Russian invasion. Suddenly, uh, GPS doesn't work over Ukraine. So the Russians are doing something. Uh, the big thing though, besides all these various other things, uh, a satellite system called Viasat uh, suddenly stopped working. And it was used by the Ukrainian military. And so the Russians did some sort of cyber attack and this is kind of a major issue. You probably haven't seen it in the press, but the, you know, go look it up. There's four or five references to it. And why it's a major issue is suddenly uh, uh, thousands of windmills in Europe generating electricity stop working because <laughs> they control them via Viasat. Uh, amazing to me, close to 10,000 different satellite modems on the ground that receive the satellite signal suddenly stopped working permanently. I don't know how you have a cyber attack actually destroy electronics inside the terminals. And so it's like, I doubt there's 10,000 uh, spare terminals in a warehouse somewhere, uh, you know, and then who pays for that? Via sat, because they didn't have right, right cyber routines. Uh, do we even have enough uh, electronic parts to make new ones. I mean, you know, it's kind of a big thing in, in one sense. But I think in summary that uh, what uh, maybe is happening, now there could be other tanks happening and I'm just not aware of it. They're keeping it quiet. But, um, you know, Russia uh, launched an anti-satellite system a few months ago and it blew up a satellite and there was a bunch of debris. It was more uh, north than uh, uh, in our, the Arctic uh, region, but 
I think that was a threat to us to not mess with GLONASS. So it was a deterrence. And number two, a few weeks later, Russians started um, threatening to take out the GPS system. No, oh, by the way, somebody told me a few months ago, the Chinese threatened to take out GPS and then they did it. In the Southern Pacific, GPS went out for a few hours. Now I have no other documentation besides somebody telling me from my network that they, they've seen it happen. So there's all these little secret things going on that you're really not aware of. Okay, so uh, question time. Uh, do people have questions? And then I'll just point out these are, um, if you want to join my LinkedIn network and get weekly emails on space warfare and so forth, you're, you're welcome to. <clears throat> so I'm open to questions. Yeah, I got one. So does um, Putin's stupid adventure in Ukraine, does that knock Roscosmos out of the space race, at least for now? Yeah, it seems like it. Um, now, there's implications both ways. Uh, there's um, a website, or I forget now, but there's a, a, a US, uh, not US, it's a UK satellite system uh, like SpaceX is doing, thousands of satellites going up, or maybe it's 100, maybe it's six, 700 that are going up that the uh, British bought out. And they uh, were launched, they were using Soyuz, Russian Soyuz uh, rockets to launch them from Kazakhstan, a former Soviet Republic, but I guess it's still kind of controlled by Russia. And with all these sanctions, Russia says, well, we're taking our ball and going home. We're not gonna launch your satellites. We were supposed to launch them next month. There's 36 of them on there and we're not gonna do it. We're not gonna return the money that you already paid us to launch it. And we're not gonna return your 36 satellites, you know? So uh, it's that. Um, the uh, Europeans use Soyuz rockets to launch from Air, uh, Gianna, Air, Arion, um in uh, South uh, America. And they, they have some of their own uh, rockets, but they, uh, Russia pulled out of that. Uh, there's very, Russia has threatened, again, it's kind of a space warfare. They say, oh, by the way, and I didn't know this, um, the Russian module, on the International Space Station is the main module that keeps the space station from falling out of the sky. It every once in a while has to thrust because it's kind of low and uh, you know it's dragging there. A little bit of atmosphere is dragging it down. And they said, "Oh, we're just not going to help you anymore." You know, and then we're not going to launch astronauts. And um, oh, by the way, an American astronaut is supposed to come back on a Soyuz rocket in the next few weeks, and we're not going to let them do it. So now they've changed in their mind, I think, and all. So it's all this back and forth going on. And oh, yes, it, it will hurt them in one sense. See, the trouble is you got to think of the long term, like the Chinese are good at that. So you make the Russians less dependent on our technology, and then they develop their own technology, or they get it from China. And so we're pushing them closer to China. And they say, oh, we take you off the SWIFT banking system. Well, China has its own banking system. And so maybe the Russians will go to that and that'll become more popular, at least in Asia and all. So there's these consequences ultimately. Paul, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, there's been a lot of um, speculation in the press lately that um, Russia may be planning uh, some cyber attacks on on the US as a result of what's going on in Ukraine. And um, last, last spring or so, uh, President Biden uh, announced apparently to the Russians about 20 different uh, uh, places that cyber attacks would be um, essentially, if, if Russia tried to attack them, that would become a major attack on, on us. And they were all sorts of various um, systems within our country from uh, hydroelectric power to banking systems to GPS and everything else. Uh, my question is how well positioned is the US to um, protect and stop anything like that if should Russia do it? I don't believe we're protected at all. Uh, That's what I thought. The, you know, uh, getting back to the uh, 2014 and the cyber attacks on the American banking system, 
you know, like Mellon Bank and all that. Mellon Bank alone uh, invests $250 million a year, a quarter billion dollars a year in cybersecurity. And the Russians went right through them. And I think the lesson here is, and something SpaceX should learn too, that as a company, you might think you're big and strong and worth billions and all that, but you can never go up against a whole country where you got, I don't know, 80 million people in Russia, whatever it is. Uh, they're well known as cyber hackers. Um, I've heard at least years ago that they're better at computer programming than us because they had crappier computers. So they had to do lower level programming and things like that. Now I know 35 years ago, uh, I knew the cyber warriors in LA and I got a briefing on that. And I was just astounded what they can do going through the plug and so forth. And then another data point, um, last May, I was in San Antonio at a cyber, space cyber exercise. And this is where the actual cyber war, uh, warriors show up and they build a fake satellite in a lab. They put it on air bearings. They get a real satellite antenna and communicate with it. And then there's a red team and a blue team, you know, and the blue team defends the red team attacks. And so they were duking it out for a week. And then the last day of the exercise, the blue team says, oh, I'm going to put in uh, what's called a digital twin, which is a simulation of the satellite. And the red team it was like 25 members of the actual cyber warrior team attacked the um, this fake uh, simulation of the satellite all day, <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay, guys, I think you can easily be fooled. Uh, I think we, you know, put too much on cyber. Uh, I think we've gotten lazy. We've, our warfare has been against third rate countries over the last 40 years or whatever. And, you know, you think of the Air Force, when is the last time the air war was in doubt for the Air Force? Early World War II, not even late World War II, you know, Korea, Vietnam, no, they always won. And so you get lazy thinking. And so we think, uh, oh yeah, cyber, we, we've got this covered. And I, I am surprised there hasn't been uh, real major cyber attacks yet. And I think there must be some sort of deterrence going on in the ground cyber. I, I'm pretty sure it's going on in space, but of course that's easily broken. Um, think of another thought experiment. Let's say we got a, a war happening in the Western Pacific and suddenly one of our satellites blink out, it stops working. And the trouble is, is uh, you know, I've, I've seen these satellite controllers. You're sitting there at the controller, you know, and it's 3 a.m. in the morning and suddenly it stops working. Well, I don't know what happened, you know. I can't, I'm not physically there. Um, so if we're at war with China, we might say, oh, okay, it must be the Chinese. But are you sure? Is it the Russians stirring the pot? So maybe we have this balance of cyber warfare in space and on the ground. Um, and, you know, there's sort of a deterrence factor, but I bet you it's easy, even some private hacker to start making attacks. And I, I don't know how unstable leadership is on both sides. What really is their sensitivity to cyber attacks? And now there's been a lot of cyber attacks. I mean, you know, uh, what was it, Stuxnet against the Iranian centrifuges that destroyed, I'm sure, tens of millions of dollars of equipment. No one went to war over that. Though I would think if suddenly our, our we lost power and water and things. Now, you know, maybe one city does versus, you know, which happened in Texas anyway last year. I don't know, you know, how that works. And the trouble is there's no history to know how that's going to work. Now, I don't know if I'm beyond my time. You guys tell me I can keep going on. Tony, you, you need to unmute. Well, that would help. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, Kurt Vincent has a, a hand up, so he has a question. You can keep Actually, I, I want to interject something before Kurt speaks. So Kurt is my guest, and I want to tell you all that he's going to be speaking on May 11th 
about cybersecurity. Uh-huh. So it's it's I told them like, dude, you, you have to come and hear Paul talk. So now Paul, uh, Kurt's got a question, but I just want to let you all know that um, this I think ties in very nicely and is a good segue into the May 11th talk. Great. Yes, thank you very much. And Paul, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation and your opinion. I just want you to know that um, I won't get into me. This is about you. But uh, basically, I'm retired Army. I've been involved in cyber for many years. And the one thing I wanted to ask you, though, is I, I too, found it very interesting when you said that the Glossnaz went out in the order of one, two, three. And usually that is a, a message that's being sent um, versus uh, adding something, uh, doing something randomly. And I'm just kind of curious if you think maybe, and it's all speculation, whether the Alaskan um, satellite event was a message back or just what your opinion is on that and by the way and then i'll then i'll leave you with this thought and i do love saying this to everyone and that is in the cyber world there is no such thing as a combatant everybody's a combatant it doesn't matter what age you are (laughs) by uh alaska incident you're talking about the russian anti-satellite test yes yes If, if that was if you thought that was a response yeah, um, I think uh, the Russians responded, I think it was about six months later, after we took out the GLONASS uh, satellite system. Um, suddenly, uh, an American GPS satellite, a few months later, blinked out, sort of in the same manner, you know. And they said, oh, it was old and it, this and that. You know, they have all these excuses, but it was more than just the satellite. It was a bunch of satellites around them because they shared data. And I never heard of GPS failing in that manner. So I, I was going to do the orbital dynamics on that, but I was afraid that people would investigate me because of it or something, you know. Uh, so I, I didn't push my luck on that. But I, I can always say I have the orbital elements of all satellites since 1957 that I download over two every two weeks. So I that's how I did the GLODAS thing. I know where things are at. And you know this is a software you can get for free online, quite frankly, and so I can monitor that. And there's people around the world who do monitor these things. There's private companies, surprisingly, who do monitor that. Um, it doesn't take much. Uh, there's uh, astronomers who band together, and it costs ten to twenty thousand dollars to get a fully automated telescope that they put someplace that has good skies some country can do that and put it in their embassies around the world and better understand when uh, major powers are in space war, I would think, for a few million dollars, you know? Uh, And gee, maybe the UN should do it. God, maybe the Vatican should do it, (laughs) you know, as a, you know, at churches around the world that has good weather and and all that as sort of a, you know, what do you call it? Somebody who's not, you know, got uh, skin in the game. Um, And that's not exactly cyber, but uh, cyber is the favorite technique. Uh I know, I worked with cyber warriors for 27 years. Um, To me though, uh, it's uncertain. And, you know, getting back to this, oh, well, it's one thing attacking Iraq. There's another thing going to war with Russia or China. You're going to have much smarter adversaries. I mean, the Chinese, um, the unclassified number, there's 100,000 Chinese working space. It's much higher than classified. Hmm. You take just 5% of that, 5,000 engineers and so forth, put them in some secret program for 10 years, lock them away, and their only job is to fool some poor captain who's out of school in a uh, space watch center at 3 a.m. and to fool him into thinking everything's all right, yet he's about to lose a few billion dollars worth of space gear from cyber attacks or something. Uh, who do you think is going to win that? These 5,000 scientists working 10 years of this poor captain in this watch center. Yeah. So there, there's this imbalance, I guess. Uh, and maybe deterrence does work. But I uh, know I think we're very vulnerable. I think you're living in a Disney fantasy world, you LA guys, that uh, uh, 
we yeah we can defend this and they have the same fantasy going on for the space force and we know where everything's at even yeah. though quite frankly one third of the objects up there we're not really sure what they are they're called analyst objects so you don't really know what you're talking about really well, cool bird hill has a question as well sure uh, yeah um i uh 30 years ago when i was working at Bechtel, um i uh, traveled to russia twice um uh, during less and less and i stayed in a town at that time that didn't wasn't on the map called troitsk and i spent some time it. learning what they did at troitsk and i actually uh, did some education work back and forth and studied how the education system worked uh is is uh, troitsk involved in any of this stuff that yes, i don't know for a fact and if i did i, I couldn't really tell you i mean I haven't, I once had 86 different security clearances, but that all timed out uh, nine years ago when I retired. I'm 70 years old, actually. And um, so I'm not sure uh, what the question is, but certainly, uh, or what the answer is, certainly the Russians uh, have had anti-satellite programs. Certainly they have cyber weapons. Certainly they have laser weapons pointed towards space. Um, same with the Chinese. Uh, so I would say the US is the biggest player. It used to be Russians number two. I think they're number three past China now. Uh, Troy Sky, I don't know offhand, but yeah, there's a lot of infamous laser sites. Um, I, I just aside, I heard a story once of the, somebody who went to Russia and they, uh, they were in their hotel room and they said, oh boy, it's awfully dark in here. I hate this. And the next day the lights were brighter, you know. Yeah. In other words, you're being monitored and, and, yeah. and you know, things like that. So that's I, the I became aware of that also. But at yeah. that time, that was the, the home of things like fluid dynamics. The equivalent of our Lawrence Livermore Laboratories was located there, but but the city was not on the map at the time. Now it is, no. I, I discovered. But uh, well, I, uh, you know, we even joked at that time, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union fell. That let's just pull some of our lunch money and hire a Russian scientist. You know, you can come and get yeah. them cheap. You know, do what? I don't know. You know, but <laughs> yeah, I, I was amazed at what they could do with uh, laptops and everything else. And as you said, they, they were very, very sophisticated with our Western technology more than we were, I felt. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, so it's going to uh, open up a little bit. And uh, then, Anastasia, you had your hand up. Uh, so when I stop this, Go ahead and ask your question.